Back in the Prohibition era United States, so from about 1920 until 1933, when the sale, transportation, importation, and production of alcohol was prohibited in the country due to a constitutional ban, there was good money to be made if you were willing to make, transport, and or produce alcohol, willing to do what was necessary to get it into the hands and livers of people who wanted it, and were able to do it behind the backs of, or in some cases with the paid participation of, members of law enforcement. Many of the most popular mob stories set in the United States are set during this period, because the heyday of organized crime in the states, of the Tommy Gun and Fedora variety at least, was powered by a thriving black market for alcohol and other banned goods. These organizations formed, or in some cases expanded, to take advantage of the arbitrage opportunity between supply and demand that arose as a consequence of the ban. It was famously difficult to catch any of the mob bosses behind these exploits in the act at this time, too, because a lot of what they were doing was easy to make go away, with a well-placed bribe or assassination, and a bad rap could always be deflected to an underling, allowing the bosses to continue running free while one of their peons did the time on their behalf. Also making the capture and prosecution of these crimes tricky, though, was that many of them came with fairly meager punishments and required comparably high levels of proof to actually charge someone. Someone like Al Capone, then, who was one of the most successful and notorious gangsters in the United States during this era, could publicly flout his crimes, live a lavish lifestyle, and then show very little money on his official accounting records, even to the point that he was charged with vagrancy, with homelessness, basically, several times, because despite living the lifestyle of a multimillionaire, he didn't have any official income or a home that could be officially linked to him in a way that would stick. And as a result, he was in and out of court on small things like that, despite everyone knowing that he was basically running the criminal world in Chicago and the surrounding area, controlling a significant portion of the local government infrastructure, and thumbing his nose at the federal government while he did it. Eventually, an assistant attorney general named Mabel Walker Willebrandt realized that although it was cumbersome to the point of impossibility, to get serious charges related to mob crime and prohibition laws to stick to any of these gangsters, it was possible that they could pursue them for tax law violations, namely, that they clearly had vast sums of money based on their lifestyles, but they never filed tax returns on those funds. During earlier negotiations with Capone, his lawyer offered to pay the government taxes based on some acknowledged income, if the government would be willing to normalize legal relations with the mob boss in the future. Instead of making that deal, the government used those previously admitted figures as a starting point for an investigation into Capone's finances, and were eventually able to nail him in a secret grand jury trial in 1931 for 22 counts of income tax evasion, before releasing him on bail. Federal agents were then able to cripple his finances, and that started a chain of events that led to his indictment on about 5,000 prohibition law violations. In the post-Capone era of U.S. gang-related criminality, syndicates began creating believable, or at least defensible, public-facing facades for their enterprises, meaning they would have legit-seeming business entities that they could point at, if officials ever came knocking, asking them where their incomes came from and asking to see their accounts. Even before Prohibition ended, this became common enough that government officials had to refocus a decent amount of effort not just on tracking obviously criminal behavior, but also tracking money of any kind to see where it started, where it ended, and what happened to it in between. Tax evasion wasn't a reliable hook to catch the cannier of these mob bosses anymore because of this change in posture 
So they needed to be able to show that the money that was eventually documented in these books, seemingly from legitimate sources, actually originated with shady dealings, which wasn't easy. And there weren't a lot of legal tools that allowed them to dig deeper and trace those threads more thoroughly for a decent chunk of time, for several decades. In 1956, though, a few existing and a bunch of new rules related to what became known as money laundering were bundled together into 18 U.S.C. section 1956, which delineated, among other things, all the many behaviors that are now officially considered to be laundering for legal purposes, including things like, quote, engaging in a financial transaction involving the proceeds of certain crimes in order to conceal the nature, source, or ownership of proceeds they produced, end quote, and quote, smuggling unreported cash across a U.S. border, end quote. Despite all the specifics that are now on the books, though, at its most fundamental, laundering money is just, as the name implies, making money clean enough to be used openly. If you make $1,000 selling illegal drugs or smuggling something illegal across the border, you now have $1,000 in cash. But if you want to use that money in any form except cash, putting it into a bank or the stock market, for instance, you need to be able to show where that money came from, to show an income stream or some kind of activity that could theoretically have netted you that kind of revenue in a legal way. Lacking such official documentation for income, it becomes tricky to spend said cash. At a certain relatively low level, it's probably fine. You just pay with tangible money, and no one's the wiser. But if you're earning tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands, or millions of dollars, it becomes an issue. Especially if you start paying for big things in cash, which tends to attract red flags unless you're willing to stick with the underworld marketplaces for the rest of your life, which is a way of living that comes with its own risks and downsides. Thus, it often makes sense to figure out a means of cleaning the money you earn illegally, so that the income seems to be legitimate, according to the legal processes for such things. You might, for example, partner with someone who owns a hair salon or a car wash, two businesses that tend to be cash-heavy, meaning someone often pays in cash rather than with a credit card or other more trackable methods. And as part of that deal, they increase their reported revenue by a few hundred dollars each month. They make it look like business has experienced an uptick. They take a cut of that additionally reported revenue, which is paid from your stockpile of illegal, uncleaned cash, and they pay you the rest for some kind of fake service that looks good on paper. Maybe you do consulting work for them, according to their accounting documentation. And the upside is that they pay you 85% or so of the money that you give them to launder each week. So you lose a bit of what you wanted to get cleaned as a fee, but now 85% of that money you got laundered is available to be used for whatever you like, rather than only being spendable as cash or on the black market. You could also cut out the middleman and invest in your own laundering infrastructure, buying some kind of cash-heavy legitimate business, and funneling your illegal income through that business alongside the legitimate income it earns, slowly but surely churning through your illegal cash stockpile and making it bankable, spendable, and legit-seeming. Governments around the world today have an array of tools and techniques for rooting out even medium-scale versions of this kind of scheme, so there's always the chance that even a clever and low-key laundering setup will be figured out eventually. And the consequences for those who are caught laundering money can be significant, including the loss of one's money stockpile and other assets, but also prison time. That said, Just because laws exist doesn't mean they're utilized to the fullest extent, and it doesn't mean they're applied equally across all people and entities who might run afoul of them. What I'd like to talk about today is a recent revelation about the scale of contemporary global money laundering and what the divulgence of this information might mean for the future of this type of investigation. (laughs) 
listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're finding some value in what I'm doing here, consider becoming a supporter. The most straightforward way to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. Folks who contribute any amount each month receive an additional episode of the show each month as a thank you. But there are other monetary and non-monetary ways of supporting the show as well. You can find a list of those at letsknowthings.com slash support. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support the show in some way, shape, or form. And thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to unspool today comes from BuzzFeed News, and it's entitled The FinCEN Files, with the subtitle, Thousands of Secret Suspicious Activity Reports Offer a Never-Before-Seen Picture of Corruption and Complicity and How the Government Lets It Flourish. Before I get into this particular story, the elephant in the room, anytime BuzzFeed is mentioned, at least here in the United States, is that in the minds of some the brand is inextricably associated with its early days on the internet, when it was one of the foremost purveyors of sugary pop culture articles, fact-free listicles, online quizzes, and other circa 2010 internet junk food that was great for milking ad money from Google's search algorithms, but which didn't really present anything of substance, much less credibility. That changed substantially beginning in 2011, when they hired a Politico alum to be the new editor-in-chief, and segued hard towards serious, long-form journalism, which by 2018 had earned the actual reporting-based BuzzFeed News a bunch of industry awards, including their becoming a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. The publication has not been without controversy, including one of their reporters being caught repeatedly plagiarizing back in 2013, another in 2014, and yet another in mid-2020. All three of those reporters were fired, but still, that kind of thing leaves a mark if you want to be taken seriously in the world of journalism. BuzzFeed News has also been criticized for releasing what became known as the Steele Dossier, which is a report that has not been sufficiently corroborated to the standards of most other serious journalistic entities, so most other journalists have not fully backed it. And this dossier makes several allegations against President Trump, some of which have been confirmed over the past several years, but quite a few others have not. So, while some consider the publication of this dossier to have been a legit judgment call, others, including a great many investigative journalists, consider it to have been a smear job at worst, or a click grab at best. I wanted to establish that context because, first, BuzzFeed News does have a history of sometimes towing and sometimes entirely stepping over the line of what other journalists and papers would consider to be proper journalistic propriety and even ethics. But second, I also wanted to make clear that the people who still see BuzzFeed as merely a site for figuring out which Harry Potter house they're in, or reading about the latest juicy celebrity gossip, that this news entity actually does a great deal more than that now, and they do have generally solid credibility within this space, even if that credibility is at times strained and maybe a little wobbly compared to an older, more traditional institution like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, or the Washington Post. And that context is particularly important in this case because the FinCEN files, alluded to in the title of the piece, are a collection of documents that were leaked to BuzzFeed News. And there's no way for those of us on the outside of this story to know for certain whether or not these documents are 100% credible, as is true of most leaks. That said, in this case, BuzzFeed News reached out to other investigative organizations to partner on various aspects of these reports, which means that we're not only relying on BuzzFeed's credibility here, but also the credibility of 108 other media entities and over 400 journalists, located in 88 countries, who have been working over 16 months 
to organize, analyze, and verify these documents. So although there is still reason to maintain healthy skepticism in the face of anything that is leaked in this way, this is also considered to be a legit collection of documents and a well-vetted undertaking based on the people and groups, all with a great deal to lose if they get something wrong that are involved. The primary journalistic partner in this effort has been the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which is a non-profit focused on connecting folks who work at the biggest and most well-respected journalism entities in the world and helping them share information and resources between these groups to tackle especially cumbersome stories that require a complex mix of expertise in terms of doing the reporting, but also in terms of communicating the story to people who are not journalists on the other end. In this case, that has manifested as a somewhat flashy FinCEN Files launch, which has included a steady torrent of article drops from an array of large and small publications and independent journalists, alongside a weekly podcast, organizational hubs where you can check out raw materials from the investigation for yourself, and an already stunning archive of related information and derivative pieces. And new information, articles, and other sorts of reportage are being published every day. At the center of this story is money laundering, and the global systems that are meant to prevent money laundering but which often fail to do so, and which in some cases even seem to encourage or enable it, even if that's not the intention of these systems. To understand how and why that might be the case, let's step back for a moment and talk about suspicious activity reports, which in the industry are often referred to as SARS. In 1992, the U.S. Housing and Community Development Act signed into law by George H.W. Bush, made a bunch of relatively small changes to prior laws, especially those related to housing assistance, low-income housing policies, and Section 8 assistance programs. There were some decently controversial portions of this act, but most were small enough in nature and focus, and countered by enough broadly acceptable portions, that it didn't make too much news at the time. And it was basically an effort to wrangle some complex issues orbiting around the funding and management of home-related government programs into something that made sense with other laws at the time. And Title 15 of the Act, which is called the Annunzio Wiley Anti-Money Laundering Act, was almost an afterthought to the rest of what this act did. Though as it turns out, it became a bit of a thing because it added penalties for banks found to be guilty of money laundering activities, and established the original SARS documentation guidelines. After the passing of the Bank Secrecy Act of 1970, the U.S. already had a law requiring that financial institutions in the country help U.S. government agencies detect and prevent money laundering-related activity that show up in the course of them running their businesses. This is why banks have to keep records of financial transactions, report daily aggregate transactions of $10,000 or more, and report anything that seems suspicious and which might be indicative of money laundering, tax evasion, and the like. SARS were a more specific manifestation of that same rule in that they standardized the way in which banks would report these suspicious activities to the government. Important to understanding these reports, though, is knowing that the financial institution that fills one out and submits it to the government is not allowed to tell anyone that they did so. The idea is to keep the potential criminal, who is maybe doing bad things, ignorant to the fact that the government was just made aware of their activities via these forms, so that they don't get better at concealing their efforts or go into hiding before they can be apprehended. Thus, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN for short, is meant to be the only organization that receives and knows about all of these reports, and they can then do what they deem necessary with the intel gleaned from all this confidential information flowing in from banks and other financial institutions from around the world. 
Other countries have similar setups and similar rules about who sees what, to the point that in most places that have this sort of reporting system, the reports, whether they're about money laundering or something else, like the funneling of money to terrorist organizations or some kind of bribery activity, are never seen except by that central hub that receives them, and by the individual who files them, who is often not allowed to say anything about what they reported, ever, to anyone else. And this is true even to the point that folks who file SARS are immune from the discovery phase of a trial, and they are immune to any legal repercussions related to statements made about the SARS. So they can basically lie about these documents, even in cases when doing such lying would typically earn a mere mortal some kind of criminal charge. These documents are meant to be that unknowable and invisible to everyone outside this FinCEN organization. The leaking of these sorts of documents, then, while not as obviously salacious and punchy as confidential government files related to aliens or attempted coups or something like that, is not nothing. And in fact, it actually provides a rare glimpse into an otherwise obscured world that until this moment, we could only really speculate about. The picture painted by the over 200,000 suspicious activity reports that were leaked is of a financial system that is more than willing to check the right legal boxes when it comes to this type of behavior, but which doesn't really do more than that very often. Banks and other financial institutions are legally required to file SARS and would presumably be in big trouble if they didn't, and it was later discovered that they didn't. SARS also give them legal cover if something happens, so sending them through the proper channels is in their best interest. It gets them off the legal hook for anything bad that happens related to the accounts that they work with. Once those SARS are filed with the proper authorities, though, the policy of most banks and other financial institutions seems to be to just keep doing business as usual, including doing business with these suspicious entities that they filed reports on, until and unless the government tells them to do otherwise. One of the revelations emerging from all this reporting is that very, very seldom does anything happen as a result of these reports being filed. FinCEN, the part of the U.S. Treasury responsible for determining whether the reports are evidence of criminal activity and how to proceed if they are, only has 270 employees, which means, based on the number of reports that are filed, each employee has to deal with about 150 reports each week. Though the number is almost certainly higher than that, as many of these employees probably work in a support capacity, and thus are not reading reports, or not only reading reports, 100% of the time. For context, some of the particularly complex reports took a whole team of journalistic investigators weeks or months to unravel, and that's just for one report. And though they don't have the same tools as a government worker would presumably have, it's still likely that the majority of these reports, by necessity, get merely a glance, when they probably require a great deal more than that. A lot of the initial response to this reporting has been somewhat fire and brimstone toward the banks, but a few bits of analysis have been a little more grayscale, rather than black and white, in their assessment of the situation. Finance beat journalist and author Oliver Burrow recently wrote, for instance, that the institutions are kind of doing what they're able to do, without creating more downstream problems for themselves and potentially their customers. From a recent special edition of the Coda Oligarchy newsletter focusing on the FinCEN files, quote, The outrage is justified. Money laundering is the underlying support industry that makes evil possible. Without it, mobsters, drug cartels, modern slavers, and tax evaders would struggle to operate, and the world would be a much better place. But I want to make an unfashionable observation. These leaks are evidence the banks were doing what we ask of them. Our fury should not be directed at them, but at the idiocy of the system they are operating within. And ultimately, therefore, the blame lies with the politicians." End quote. This is not a particularly heartening position, unless you're working at one of the banks that showed up in these reports 
banks that have seemingly profited off around $2 trillion worth of suspicious transactions between 1999 and 2017, which is the period that the leaked documents cover, though not in their entirety. So that's the approximate amount of the suspicious funds that were effectively laundered by these financial entities during that period, about $2 trillion. At the moment, the stocks of some of the headliners of this reportage, among them Deutsche Bank, Bank of America, and HSBC, are in freefall. But being able to pivot the conversation away from their role in this system to the nature of the rules by which they play could help them reclaim some kind of high ground, even if that new position would still be somewhat tenuous by association. That said, I talk about incentives on this show quite a lot, because especially within complex systems, incentives tend to be the motivating force behind a lot of negative and at times even initially illogical-seeming behavior. And in this case, it would seem that the incentives are lined up in such a way that the best legal position for many of these financial institutions is indeed to fill out the form and then trust that the government will take it from there. Anything else they do, including deciding not to work with someone who they think is shady, could lead to legal and or reputational repercussions, and even put them at odds with the government if they're not careful. In other words, the law is set up in such a way that banks are being encouraged not to act on these suspicions, because it's implied that the government will handle it, and that they shouldn't say a word about anything that's happening to anyone under threat of prosecution from that government. And in a perfect system, that would potentially be okay, because the government would indeed act upon this intelligence, the portions of it that do turn out to be criminal activity at least and would probably catch a decent number of bad guys as a consequence. Unfortunately, this is not the best of all worlds by many metrics, and the trend over the past few decades, but especially in the past few years in many countries, and even more especially in those countries in which the majority of this bad financial behavior takes place, the trend has been toward less regulation, less enforcement of these laws that do actually exist, and far lower budgets for the entities responsible for those regulations and enforcing those laws. What we have, then, is a structure that, in theory, as written, would probably do a decent job, but the upkeep on that system, and thus the practical application of it, leaves us wanting in terms of actual outcome. And importantly, that's almost certainly despite the best efforts and desires of the people working for these government organizations, who would no doubt love to be able to do their jobs as instructed, but simply can't because of the lack of resources and backing from those who are meant to fund them, the politicians who tend to determine those sorts of things. What we're left with, then, based on these documents and what we've been learning as more reportage based on them has been published, is a husk of an enforcement mechanism that externally many of us assumed was at least working a little bit and was set up the way that it is for a specific purpose, but which in reality is just a Potemkin village of an enforcement apparatus which has been allowing criminal behavior to operate essentially in plain sight and in such a way that those who want to clamp down on it can go through the paces without anything productive actually happening more often than not which is perhaps a default setting that the banks would like to maintain, and we may see their lobbyists pushing for that, even if the individuals who run and work at these banks and other financial institutions are not particular fans of laundering and weapon smuggling and slavery, the system of which they're a part can nonetheless allow them to look past those consequences because the current state of affairs allows them to profit from these sorts of activities to the tune of $2 trillion over the course of just short of two decades without any legal obligation to do anything about them and something close to immunity for their role in keeping these illegal activities going so long as they fill out and file the appropriate paperwork. This would seem to be an example, then, of a socially valuable leak of these documents, followed by excellent reporting, which has shined a blinding and somewhat withering light on a foundational system 
that is not doing what it's supposed to do. And again, this is a worldwide system, though a lot of the places that are meant to function, but which are not, are located in the world's largest and wealthiest economies, especially the US, UK, and some European economies, but nowhere near limited to those particular economies. We do have more evidence for some than others at this point, though, because the leaked documents that we've seen so far were focused around these particular regions. What happens next will depend in part on the response, popular and governmental, to this divulgence, and it seems likely that there will be quite a few more headline-grabbing revelations before this matter is relegated to the back pages of the news. Because of the complexity of the situation, though, and because of how slowly the mechanisms of law sometimes function, speculation amongst those in the know right now is that it will be years before anything serious changes in terms of the systems in question, and almost certainly, as well, in terms of the operational practices of those financial entities involved. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. One of the simplest ways to do so is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. But there are other means of supporting the show as well, both monetary and non-monetary in nature, and you can find a list of those at letsknowthings.com slash support. A great big thanks to everybody who's already supporting the show. You folks are the reason that I'm able to commit the time that I do to this show each week, and for that I am very grateful. The book that I'd like to recommend today is called The Apocalypse Factory, Plutonium and the Making of the Atomic Age by Steve Olson. This is a fairly straightforward history book that is very readable and somewhat narrative about some aspects of the Manhattan Project in the United States, some of the programs that led up to that, but in particular, the development of plutonium resources, the harnessing of plutonium as a fissile material, and then the consequences of using atomic bombs and other nuclear weapons by the United States. It's possible that you may have read some other World War II-era history books and not gotten deep into some of these subjects before. Some of it was certainly new to me. So if homing in on a period of decades and looking at a particular industry, but also the repercussions of the emergence of that industry, is your thing, this book is definitely worth checking out. Now, if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of The Apocalypse Factory by Steve Olson. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other podcast, Brain Lenses, wherever you get your podcasts, or at brainlenses.com. And you can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. Feel free to reach out and say howdy on your social network of choice. I'm at Colin is my name on Twitter and Instagram and such, and it's just Colin Wright on Facebook. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week.